My name is Tarek. Welcome to Soren's YouTube channel. Right, obviously, let's let's talk about some Valorant then. So sure. in Valorant, in the early days, it actually looked like it was going to be a bit like CSGO, mate. You're just in some, like, whatever teams with some, like, old players, some newer players. It looks like the same fucking story. Like, <laughs> the handbox yeah. here is just, like, whatever. What 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 took so long to get going? Why what, what what was the... What happened between the first year, year and a half or whatever, and then getting to the Envy team, which obviously then people start to know the story of it was all the great results. So what was going on the first sort of year and a half or so of Valorant? So... At the start of like early Valorant, um, we we didn't really form the Ambox team until like much later on. But um, th this was like I think I want to say like four or five months into like Valorant is like when we finally formed like the Ambox team. But there was already like some established teams like at that at that point, I guess as established as you, as you can be. But there's already um, you know obviously there's like some of the Sentinels rosters and like um, you know the MV 100 Thieves rosters that were already already kind of like established but what kind of took so long was when we first built the team we were kind of like building it from scratch so you know you we mbox approached myself and then eventually um uh android and then from there we kind of had like the hand choose and pick like everyone so a lot of the time it was just like trying to you know find tryouts for people and just because it's such a new it's such like a new game and there's so many different people coming from like all these different backgrounds and different games. You, we had to go through like just weeks and weeks and weeks of trials and just trying people out on different roles, just seeing who, who was doing like really, really well. And a lot of it was just, like I said, just building it from ground up. It, a bit, a, a something that people probably don't know is actually Kassad was a, supposed to come over at some point. Like he was okay. actually going to be the person that spearheaded the whole like Ambox uh team like he was someone that was going to choose everyone and his his initial picks were like myself and uh android and he wanted to build a team around that but eventually he got i think it was an offer from it was cloud nine or some other team they couldn't yeah. refuse it was the one where they so, made that super team with henry g and all that yeah. yeah 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 exactly so they they he eventually just swapped over that but like he started like kind of like the foundation for that team and he also brought over a uh, system called, uh, called Gogi, and not people know know much about Gogi, but he's from like uh, Serbia, and he was also a professional Dota 2 player at some point. But he he brought over that guy, and he eventually kind of left him, <laughs> unfortunately. But I, I'm kind of glad he did because he ended up being pretty integral to uh, me and just the rest of the team. But anyways, we started handpicking players, and we eventually settled on like kind of like a a five, which was like myself, Android, Seb, which is another player that you know had some history in like CS:GO. He was, he he has he's probably genuinely the nicest person I ever met. Like you could tell him anything. Like you could be the meanest guy, and he would he'd still like just be super friendly to you. He was a really good like role player in like a lot of instances. And then we picked up a uh, boy, which I don't remember his background. I think it was CS a little bit, but he he wasn't at like a professional level. And then we brought over. Uh, Poach as like an in-game leader, and his background was he was previously a Fortnite player. So that was our kind of like foundation for the team, and we kind of just you know started practicing and like getting getting to work off that. Right. Obviously, the story all changes when you join the Envy team, which after that year became Optic. It was the same lineup of players, basically. Yeah. The amazing thing about this team was, is this lineup just gets set immediately. It's not like it was one where you added players one after another. Like there's, it's in Envy already, the lineup set, and it, it, pretty quickly, it, it just gets really good, right? If people don't know, it was FNS, and it was a bunch of other people from the NA yeah. scene. Like, I mean... He calls himself Victor now. We called him food in CSGO, but it's okay. You can, you can <laughs> run away from your names, boys. Crashies, obviously everyone knows. Marved, who I will say, I'll just always say this, mate. In CSGO, you're a little bit infamous. Not really known as a good player. Bit infamous. I'll just throw that out there. Listen, you got away with it. If this is a fucking movie, it's the heist. You got away with it for now. But you know what? There's still a federal agent out there trying to hunt your case down. And then obviously in this particular team, you had Chet, who's worked with FNS. I'm a pet. Used to be called in CSGO. Those two have been a duo many, many different teams and had a lot of success together, right? This lineup, the key thing with this lineup to me is 
It's funny that so many people now obviously say Valorant is very different game to CSGO. It's got because it's like it's got all these morbid elements of how the comp plays and then how certain things counter each other and then obviously the abilities, especially yeah. like we all roll, integral, they're massive. But back then in the early days of Valorant, I do notice that like one of the strengths of this team does seem to be that like it's got all CSGO players. It's got all people who understand like fundamentals like trade fragging and how you like set up utility. Obviously FNS yeah. has worked with all CSGO players his whole career what was this first team like like it when you look back now it kind of makes sense it was good right yeah no it, it so that that was something that i kind i kind of learned like very quickly is like even going back to like the Anbox team when we picked up uh poach uh, who was previously from like fortnite like as an igl is they kind of don't have in some sense like the same like understanding in terms of like you know the ma macro like aspect because like when you go from like a, i guess like a battle royale to like you know like a I want to say like a competitive like shooter with like you know where it's uh, it's basically you know search and destroy like uh game mode where the whole goal is like you have to play out the round default around and stuff like that like a lot of those like uh you know fundamentals and just you know trading and just ba very uh, I want to say basic fundamentals but map the control basic is, like, all the concepts yeah, that, like yeah, everyone knows no, exactly. is basically, yeah it, 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 all those concepts and it's like when when you when you lack that understanding and it's like some people want to kind of like do that and other people don't it like becomes kind of like a a little bit of like a mess of like you know kind of like knowing when to do it unless you you have like a lot of experience like in those areas so um i think for me it was like really nice to like kind of like go back to the system because kind of like the whole the whole time like it, at least during like Anbox was uh we always kind of like had like a little bit of an IGL problem until we brought over Vice, and then like a lot of it was just like me like kind of like trying to like call like everything like all the util and stuff like how I want it, uh, what pacing I want it, like give me the op, like I'll just walk up here and just do whatever. So when I came over to like the the me team, it 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 was it was so nice because <laughs> like I felt for like the first time like I had like a really good like. I want to say like so. Uh, I want to say like a support system around me where it was like I had people who understood the game like on a really good level. So like if they saw me doing something, uh, even like on the map, they they'd immediately start like moving with me. So like I wouldn't even have to call like some stuff, you know. Sometimes where it's just like, yo, come with me, come with me. And, like I could almost entirely focus on my crosshair. Uh, and focus on like you know positioning myself or like you know playing my own game, and they would already be like, "Oh, Jake's moving up. Yeah, all right, come up with you know like uh, things of that nature." You know, obviously, you know, you still have to calm and stuff like that. But like, you, I guess the big thing that I, uh, that was a difference is like you you didn't have to calm as much because like just by looking where where i was like you could they they could like play around that essentially it's like oh he's taking space over here or he's pushed up hey let's do this now you know like it, it, it was stuff that didn't have to be said and that was something that was like very very like helpful for me and yeah it, i i always thought that you know even before this the envy guys were really good like historically they unfortunately they always like place like third you know and i thought probably like one of the biggest things that they probably lacked was like more of like a starish kind of player because like the core around that whole team was like really really good um they just kind of needed like that extra i guess like uh, if you want if you want to call it that that, that extra you know like just that extra fragging ability to really i think be the best in a team that's kind of like what i what i provided because even prior to that uh they lost to the two big teams at the time which were sentinels and 100 thieves so uh when we were able to make that team we i think by far we were probably the most talented team in na and not to mention you know i'm also re reunited with uh fns which is someone that i played on like three or four different teams now and we have like a pretty good like understanding with each other and we always work like really well together so i that was something that, that yeah i was excited about what was fns's calling style like what is his valorant style like his style is he's very good at not only reading the opponent but also even like his mid rounding he he knows like he can read like the other caller like really well so 
he 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 basically makes like predictions like even like in, before the round starts it's like oh because we did this they're probably going to start doing this or they haven't done this yet uh they're probably going to do this um he's he's really good with uh just in general like his mid rounding kind of kind of similar to Stan's law but i think he's a lot more defined as well even with like the start of the round he he's really good with uh just asking okay what are they doing? Okay, they're doing this, and just coming up with like a really good plan based off like uh, what they're what they're doing. I think one of his strengths is he knows how to exploit like certain like holes and gaps like in the team. Uh, basically, uh, I'm, try, I'm trying to think how best to put it. It's kind of like basically if if he notices like there's a weak spot or if like. They have like certain utility that they throw. He he can come up v- with very creative ideas on how to how to exploit it or like abuse like over rotations. Some of my, some of the best examples I can think of are like on Haven, for example, which is a three bomb site map. He's really good at um, faking a lot of pressure in towards like one area, running back, you know, uh, having two guys walk up, faking pressure in another area, and you know, force the guys, oh, oh, they're actually going this way, run all the way back, and then all of a sudden you have a guy that's, like, lurking at, you know, the other lane. So he's really good at, like, basically manipulating people's, like, rotates, making them worried about, like, a lot of different areas, and just in general just messing with, like, the, the, the opponent's rotations, making them overcommit or, like, sometimes undercommit the, like, some areas where we're just hard slamming. So that, that was something that was really, really big strength about him. In general, just also uh being able to run a team really well right even though i set it up like that like obviously this is all csgo players in this team the fundamentals are there the like even the teamwork aspect there's a reason why your team didn't have to change players whereas a lot of teams chopped and changed after all the lands right one thing is valorant as i've learned from the little i've been watching it it is very different to csgo though like some of the gun stuff is fundamental the same and obviously the concept like trading and stuff like that exists but basically Mm -hmm. this is why it's such an interesting game to me because it is a mishmash of different games like actually you do need to understand mobile concepts like how a comp works or like what counters what or which you uti- which ult to hold and which one counters the other so like was this actually like was there a learning curve for that stuff yes Va- valorant a-, a lot of <sighs> something that i think a- a- is a big mistake from like foreigner counter-strike players is they treat it as csgo with abilities you know in some sense but it's not it, it plays a lot different and some of the you know, quote unquote fundamentals that you learn in CSGO don't necessarily apply like over there. Like it's, that's not always like the, you know, if you want to call it the correct way to play. And, and often there's like so many different ways to actually play Valorant. Like it's a very, very good game for creative people, I think. Sure. So the I, I'd say like the big differences, you know, between the two is like, Valorant kind of incorporates, obviously, you know, some league aspects because obviously, you know, even in league, you have your three abilities, you have your alt. Um, the thing with the Valorant though is it incorporates also kind of like the whole idea of you can't feed into your opponent. I, I know that sounds like I know that sounds like obvious, you know, like you don't want to feed as well, like it, you know, in CS:GO, but you you really don't in Valorant because it, you get punished a lot, lot harder, not only economically, but because you give other people alts. And like ultimates, yes. like one alt can completely change the whole game. And that was something that, you know, wasn't really like present like in CSGO. I mean, you have your utility, right? You have like your nades, your smokes and flashes. I mean, the key thing is but like ch- you're saying, the problem people are not understanding is, yeah, it's round based, but as you're saying, you could just throw a round away in CSGO and it's like, whatever, you reset the next round, we've all got guns again or whatever. Exactly. As you're saying though, you actually, it's a bit like Overwatch that says you're making the other person gets closer than the ult, which at what point well, they're like godlike if they're the right carry or something, right? No, no, exactly. And it, 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 one alt, and if you feed like a team like multiple alts, and they get their alts like uh, first, what what can happen is uh, you, like I said, an alt can completely like clear out a site. Like there's just no counterplay sometimes to some of them if you don't have like the correct utility. Uh, they they are completely round defining, and if you so let's just say for example you start losing out, they get their alts first. So like even when you have gun rounds, one alt could simply counter that. And also just depending on the, you know, comp even, like some utility just hard stops your um, your your team. So it's just, 
there's a there's a lot more that I, I guess that goes into it like more than anything and even like some like agents like for example like cypher uh he has a cam that cam can get like permanent information yes. at like some points it's basically another player sometimes so uh sometimes you have to worry about breaking that or like a kills rate turret that just watches the entire lane for you and always tells you if someone's there so you have to like adjust your strategy and your macro play like based around that and like knowing i i guess like knowing what information or what the possibilities are and that's something that you didn't really have to worry about so much in counter-strike because like um like i said there's only a set number of you know things you can really kind of do in, in, in counter-strike with like the you know the utility combos and stuff like that there's a lot you can do but at some point you know it starts to look pretty similar and you you kind of know what what information they have but like that, that's not the case in valorant and not to mention even there's even some agents uh that you you have to adjust your style of play around so for example there's breach and breaches for people who don't know is he's an agent that has a lot of like more supportive utility but he has like stuns you know flashes uh like you know an ability that just clears out like entire sections of uh you know like it can clear out like big cubbies or force you back in like some areas and you kind of have to play around it in some ways because you can do trap setups off that so you have to be you have to be wary of that so it, it's always like because there's so many different agents and so many different combinations it's you it, it plays a lot lot differently to uh csgo and it's also even like individually i'd say it's harder to carry in valorant than um in csgo i think in like a lot of ways because in csgo you can stay alive like pretty often you can have like you can dodge flashes and stuff like that and you can leave like maybe a star player like on a site and he'll probably get like one or two you know uh tuck tuck back between the smoke but you can't really do that in valorant if they have the right util because you have to worry about when, when you have like flashes stuns and then you know flashes you can't even dodge then you have like stuff like pinging above you you have to worry about darts and then you have to worry about like some guy two guys like you know uh flying over your head like coming in behind you it's it's very hard to have like uh impact sometimes as a star player if a team plays it correctly if they just hard e execute on you it's very very difficult so yeah it, like i said it, it plays a lot different i think it's a lot more um team oriented and like utility focused than for example like counter strike let me flip that though. I understand on the team aspect why it's like sure. that, but individually, especially for your role, actually, in some ways, it's all P as fuck to be the carry because I, yeah. I remember it was described to me. You, you probably guess who I talked to with the old CS GoPro. One of sure. the old CS GoPros once described it to me like this. He said, "Think of this. Imagine if when Simple has the AWP, he also could like run in, shoot someone." dash back outwards or later obviously with Jim like teleport to the other side like that would be like fuck yeah. what like how would anyone deal with him like he'd just be the <laughs> no, most OP yeah. player ever right like even though obviously we'll talk later about the chamber angle when you were in the jet meta though this is when this was a dominant as fuck agent that just completely like yeah. would define the whole meta and again it's yeah. a super powerful one where you can do a lot you can essentially sort of set yourself up and go in the into the fucking take the jewels and stuff right like this it seemed like you enjoyed this time period right, when jet was the dominant one I, I've always the I I really liked it when I guess like Jet was like a little bit more overpowered. Like uh, I I really enjoyed uh, uh, her kit quite a bit because the dash that she had basically you just basically you just fly across the screen. <laughs> I mean get to like a lot of deep positions. I really enjoyed that. Well, I also really liked the uh, chamber kind of like area as well. I guess for you know obvious reasons where I just have like a a sheriff like every single round. You know, no matter no matter the situation, which you know it can be very very nice, um, and not to mention your ultimate is like an, another op, so you can always have like um, you can always have like an op in hand, especially since they they actually nerfed the op in like a lot of ways in terms of uh, like economy wise. It's very hard to actually save for it sometimes now because uh, something that's also a little bit different from CS:GO is. People can't save, for example, for you for the op as well because everyone's like, if you want to call it their kit, everyone's kit costs different amounts of money. So some, some, especially the more supportive players, which they have more utility, um, it's going to cost like a lot more. So sometimes you can't; those people can't save the op for you. So you always have to kind of 
you know, be saving your money, or sometimes you just have to rifle. You know, there's no other al alternative. So, but um, yeah, during that whole period, it it was uh, yeah, it, cha chamber was, chamber was a lot of fun because essentially, like you said, it's you get an op out, you take your duel, and you can instantly like reposition off of it. But something that kind of happened, like I guess as a, as the game has progressed, is at the start there wasn't a lot of agents that could really deal. I think with Chamber, especially uh, at the start. Now they added in, um, like for example, Fade, and I think they added in a few different. Yeah, they added in like Harbor and like a few different other the controllers in which it's the game is a lot different now to where they have utility actually to clear you now because a lot of the times you would in order to actually push off like a chamber player you would have to you would have to dump so much utility to clear every single angle because he could hide behind a box and just simply get it basically all the one and done angles that pros talk about in the past where it's like oh you just get a kill or something like that uh, and then you're instantly traded. All of those were broken by chamber because you could get a kill and instantly always get out. So you have to clear everything very methodically. And now the game is kind of evolved to the point in which like you have utility that can just do that for you. Like bait is a one, for example. And it's like, a, it, I, I don't know how to describe it, but it's basically like something that's like, it's a little like blob that you send out. And if it sees you, it just tags you and just run and just screams and runs at you. And just, and if it hits you, you blind you. So you're always forced back. And you have like a bunch of other like recon abilities now to where it like always scans your positions and can clear all these like off angles that you have now. But as you said, at the time it, it was like really, really OP. But I don't know. I it, it, it's hard to say. I I wanna say I wanna say it's harder, but I like you said, it it's it's kind of mixed because like some of the agents' abilities uh, allow you to get out of, allow you to go and do some very crazy aggressive plays that you could otherwise not have, or you know, even with like Jet, for example, you can get knives, and like knives is basically if you you can just one tap everyone and just fly across the screen. It's very hard to actually like hit that person, kill that person. So if you have a lot of skill, you can like capitalize off of it. But yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. It, it's like it's like a watch. I I tend to lean towards it being. Uh, a little bit harder just because i feel as if 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 a team does stuff correctly where they just slam the site it's there's not a lot of options for you at least in my opinion right obviously the thing about the envy team was you basically hit the ground running immediately like it was already going fairly well in the online portion you get to the first tournament the masters in berlin and basically like if you're someone who think about like, if people watch the cs go interview like how slow the gradual rise up was now you had a couple yeah. of slips back down this had to be the dream because like, you basically hit the ground running individually as well you're just carrying the fuck yeah. out of every game yeah so um no yeah i i uh I actually approached uh, Valorant like a lot different because for me it kind of represented my like last chance like as a as a player because like if I failed in Valorant then there's like nothing left you know at that point and I think I think for me it was just I wanted to make sure I did like everything right so even like before I I was with those envy guys um, I. I made sure, like, I, I focused on, like, everything. So I was, I was reading, like, books and everything, how to deal with mental. So, like, next time I had, like, an opportunity with uh, the Envy guys, like, I would do things right. Like, my mentality would be in the right place. I would know how to address, like, some of these feelings. And I'd just be very, like, observant of, like, everything that's going on, you know, and a lot more, like, just aware. And that that was, like, kind of, like, my approach when I joined, like, with the, the Envy guys. Because, as you said, we started hitting the ground running. and um, I started just applying like everything I knew. So when I went to this land tournament, you know, I was making sure, yeah, you know, my mental's in the in the right spot. Like, um, making sure like I I do my due diligence and like prepping for these teams. Really starting to like, um, you know, study like other opponents and really making sure like I had like a good game plan like for myself. Um, and just really just applying like everything that I've learned <laughs> uh, after like just so long from like just other like top professionals and just other people in like other areas of like, you know, sports in general. So, um, yeah, I, I, I was really happy to see all of it like pay off in the long term because 
I, I think I think one of the biggest issues for me as well is just I've never had like a uh, a lot of, a lot of people have like you know siblings or stuff like that that uh, you know that they, they can learn from or like people that you know they're a part of the scene like I think Nico had uh, you know Kassad and I think Simple had like a brother or something like that and they have like good people in the scene that are at like the high levels that can teach them like valuable lessons but I've never had someone that actually helped me with that area so a lot of it was just like learning it all on my own it's like you know how do i deal with like some of these problems i'm facing or like um you know just learning so much about <laughs> just uh, just sports in general because uh, even prior to that i didn't have like much of a, like a, a sports background so um like i said it, a lot of it was just uh applying like what I knew. And when I, I finally came to, uh, you know, the NBA guys, especially on that Berlin run, it all started like coming together. And I started just to really like, um, carry and just do really well. Like I was very confident in like my play and just being able to, uh, you know, finally break through, I guess, these hurdles that I've been dealing with. Like I, 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 at that point I knew I had, I had what it, it took essentially, if that makes sense. But obviously, in this sense, I am actually uniquely positioned because I actually checked it today before we did the interview, what the timestamps were. And when you say you were looking into books and stuff, you actually asked me in April of 2018, which is before even that major run at Serenity, you yep. actually had sent me a DM where it was basically just like, can you have some like books on like sports? How do you like competitive mindset stuff? Yep. What would you recommend? Because famously, I always tell people I've read a lot of books like that and biographies and stuff. And so I recommended a bunch of books that were essentially about either like competitive mentality or some of them were sort of like people's stories of how they became top competitors and stuff. Mm. And what I'll tell you is this, almost no pro ever asks me for those. Those are ones where it's like, if I become friends with like device, Elige, it's more like when I notice they're like got to a certain level and they get stuck, I tell them in the DM, like, are you, do you like to read? Check out this book, like this book, you know, this guy had to overcome yeah. these problems. And I, what I'll say is this, some of them do it. And some of them, by the way, like that, that list of names, pretty fucking fire right there. Like some of them became the greatest players ever. Ever. But I will say this as well, yeah. I've done it to some other players who were like had skills, and a lot of players just don't ever read the book, or they may probably like crack the page, do the Instagram picture, and then never bloody finish it. You actually already read them. You came back and asked to dive more. Like it seems like actually you had like a in terms of like a mindset of wanting to improve, like you knew there was more out there, right? Yeah, I, I've always known that like um for me, I, I don't feel like talent has ever been like an issue because I feel like I like to think I have like a good mind for the game in terms of like how how I position myself in terms of like the whole like macro aspect and just being able to direct and uh, control th different things. But I uh, there was always just something that for some reason I couldn't like always like apply it in game to the to the ability like I wanted to like something would like get in the way and it's like it, it always it always felt so weird because like I know I have like the ability I know I have I guess like the talent to be like at like a certain spot but I'm not there. So, so it's just like, and for some reason, like I can't apply it in like some of my games. So like, that's why, uh, you know, for me, like I wanted to reach out because like, there's obviously some stuff I don't know. And yeah, man, that, that, that even gets me like a whole, <laughs> a whole nother journey. Um, but yeah, no, no, as you said, like, I feel like a lot of people, um, unfortunately this is, is true for the North American scene in particular is like, there's always like the whole idea of like, Oh, Hey, you know, like, uh, people want to like work hard and like, you know, they think it's stuff. try hard and or whatever. Right. They just want to play yeah, and, like they, chill they, and they be cool, like a rock and but, roller or whatever. But, but I feel like for the vast majority of people, their version of try hard is playing a whole bunch of like, yeah, you know, ranked or death match, yes. you know, it's just a player, <laughs> right? they don't want to study it. They want to play it. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, like what I've realized is like, in order to be, yeah, maybe if you want to say like the greatest, you have to be well-rounded in like a lot of different aspects. Like usually the best are the ones that have like all the different fundamentals down, whether that be with like, you know, having like a good mental, having like good positioning, being adaptable. It's like a whole bunch of different traits that you are good with to a very, well, not good with, great with that, to, hey, you're basically great with uh, basically what I'm trying to get at. It's like, you're just, you, you're just extremely well-rounded. So um, for me, a lot of it was just like, kind of like developing these skills and just learning essentially what I don't know. You know, it's like, 
what is it that like is holding me back in like a lot of different instances? What separates me versus maybe some like other people? And just trying to like um, work through it. Because I think for the uh, as well, uh, one of the lessons I came over from Valorant is I took it a little too far in CS:GO, where I'd almost try to copy like other other players, okay. you know, like how they would like you know. Uh, what spots they would play in or like some of the stuff they, they try to do. And in some senses, it's good to copy, uh, especially if you're like a new player, because like you don't know what you don't know. Right. But at a certain point you have to realize you can never be that player, that other player that you're looking at. So whether that's simple, Nico, you know, uh, myself, Zaiwu, you know, it, there's so many different players that um, you can look at, but, you will never have like that decision making or you know exact same style as they do, you know, because you're just different people. So a uh, big part of Valorant as well was just figuring out, you know, switching that mindset from like, okay, there's no one really to look at in like Valorant. And it's like, what is it that what do I think is like the best way to play, you know? And like and basically just evaluating that and like just working completely on myself in terms of like what is my style and like what is it that I envision is like the best possible valor and trying to work from there essentially. So yeah, that, I, that, that was like a big thing and just, just studying and just learning as much as I can. And I think one of the lessons I've come to learn is often you can, <sighs> one of the mistakes I think I made in the past was like, sometimes I would only like focus on, for example, like, you know, CSGO and Valorant, so I would never divulge into, like, all these different areas, uh, whether it be, like, art, whether it be, like... You can uh, take you know, things from other sports. areas, right? Exactly. And so I started... So when I would, like, go into, like, chess, for example, I could take over... I could take, you know, examples and stuff from, like, you know, top players like Magnus or, like, uh, uh, that area. So you could take stuff from basketball with, like, Michael Jordan and how he would approach things or Kobe Bryant and, like, some of the stuff he did... Um, there's so many great like shows and documentaries on like their mindset and how they and uh, what challenges they had to overcome. And they even like, you know, Roger Federer and like um, Nadal. There's, there's, there's so many like good examples of like just people who they, they were at the top of their field and like what separates them, you know, lessons they've learned and just uh, how they deal with like, you know, whether that be inconsistency or, you know, maybe it's like they have like some pressure issues. And for me, like, when I finally got into that area, you know, I could relate to like a lot of the same struggles I have. And I was able to actually find like lessons I could, you know, learn from those different areas. So, and <laughs> for the longest time, you know, I was just so focused on like uh, CSGO, you know, I just neglected all those different areas. But I, I mean, just having all these different skills and having all this knowledge in different areas, it just improves you both as, a, you know, just a player and I think just a human. So. Right, let's actually talk about some matches then, because obviously sure. at this VCT, the Berlin Masters won. The big match that made it all possible was obviously that fucking epic one against Sentinels, right? Because at the time, yeah. it was Sentinels' era. They were the best. They all thought they were the best. Everyone said they were going to win forever. All the NA fans were loving it. This game had to be fucking huge. Honestly, um, I, I knew like going in that we were going to win that series 100%. Like, I had zero doubt in my mind that we were going to win that. Um, just because... Uh, if you, some fun, fun history is, um, uh, even when I was on the ant box, like, I, the Sentinels guys would sometimes troll practices quite a bit. And <laughs> I remember there being so many instances of... Um, they would buy, like, five Odins. Which, if you if you don't if you don't know Odin, if you're coming from CS:GO, it's basically like a negev. And essentially, what they would do is uh, they would just spam everything, you know. So they would just call, this happened like so many times where it'd just be like a few rounds, and just three or four people would just buy them and just spraying across the map, and it's just like, you know, what, what are we doing here? You know, like what's <laughs> it's like it's just it's just ruining practice, you know. So I I knew like you know going in that. Yeah, you know, they have a very short half life. I, I feel because like you just stop think, taking stuff seriously, you know, just because like you're the best, or you start like trolling around in practices, or like stop practicing. I mean, it's gonna catch up to you. You know, people will catch up, and 
I, I was really confident. Like we played prior to that um, one time, and that it was after like a week's worth of practice. And they, it was a two zero. But if you actually look at the rounds and look at that game, the only reason they won was off some insane heroic clutches. Like they had like a one v three clutch, or some guy pulled off like a miracle like four or five k. Because the score lines I think were like thirty nine, thirty ten. They barely won. And I knew from that point forward that we would never lose again to them again after that series. And that they they, they weren't going to be like a top team anymore. The only team that we might have considered like a little bit of a challenge would be 100 Thieves, but we uh, we also took care of, I guess, them like later on as well. Right. Obviously, you got all the way to the final at this big LAN, but the problem is... I mean, it's funny that Sentinels has just been passed back and then everyone obviously knows this is when fucking yeah. Gambit was like, I mean, there's a reason why even for the next year where they didn't do all this stuff, people used to still talk about them in a cosh tour. Like, it's Gambit. They're like the fucking gods. You know who could beat them. Yeah. Like, I mean, in that yeah. sense, you know who could have beat them in this fucking tournament, right? We, we could have beat them, I, I, for sure. There there was a few reasons why I felt like we, we didn't. Um, one of them is like, I know a few of our guys got like almost like no sleep, I think, because like we played the 100 Thieves guys. And I think it was that like our match ended at like 11, 12 o'clock. Then we had like a match at like, you know, seven or eight. So <laughs> it's just like it was like a super early okay. match. Like after. So people got like almost like no sleep. And then even like going in um, for the final. Yeah. The final was just really early the next day. Okay. No, no it, that, that's happened a few times where I, I think even happened yeah. at this uh, last, uh, well, most recent champions, the 2022 one is like that, even that final, because we were at the lower bracket and went like all five map series, we ended at like uh, like 12 or like 1 a.m. And it's just like early 8 a.m. match. And it's just like, man, okay. <laughs> you, you just. It's it's just like you come down from like some of the adrenaline and stuff like that. And it's like oh, you got to go to bed, you know, right yeah, now. Yeah, if people and don't then, know, it's a famous concept actually. Also, for people even who are broadcast talent, if you work the whole thing, it's like even if it, even if on the clock it says you should be able to get seven or eight hours sleep, you can't. Like you're saying, you can't just jump straight into bed because you've been up all the time thinking and talking and you're watching the game. And so afterwards, you, you need like you're, three you're hours like to just fucking, Yeah, yeah, no, yeah exactly. you need to be able to like de stress, like decompress, or like like some, and then maybe you can sleep like two hours, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, I remember like one you know, on like one of the 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 very finals, like someone just like he had to be uh, woken up like right before like the, they were they were uh, like calling like people down because like like I said, it's just people uh, couldn't get like enough sleep, you know, because the matches were some of the the final matches were like so early. But anyways, uh, that's not to make excuses. But um, so even in during that um, what should I call it that uh, Berlin run. The final was interesting. I'm trying to remember. I something that's not very well known is you know one of the players that was having like a really like kind of like pop off tournament. Uh, it was actually Nats, and he had a his Viper was like really 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 strong. Um, and this was like kind of the first time like uh, Viper was like seen at like a really high level. Like previously, it was always like you know duelists who were doing like most of the fragging, the people who are like getting the most engagements, but this guy had a very like lurky style. It was it almost if you want a good analogy, it's probably like get right of like some sense where he's okay. just like always like lurking up, taking timings, and he has like good aim to back it up. So not only does he have like good intuition, but he has a uh, good aim to back it up. So he knows when to do it. And even if you know he's sometimes doing, sometimes he just hits the shot. But there's actually a bug that <laughs> he kind of like exploited that was not really well known. So uh, Viper, if you don't know, has a smoke. And you can basically you have fuel and you can basically put the smoke like up and down. Uh, as soon as you throw it, it's like a it's like a rechargeable smoke essentially. But something that wasn't well known is if you go inside the smoke and drop it, you see the person outside the smoke way before they see you. It's basically but, the concept from CSGO is like a one way this scenario. Like one, yeah, you can yeah, see exactly. them, but they can't see you. Right. But yeah, that sounds OP as fuck. Yeah, yeah, it's a movable one way too. So you can just right. pick it up. Oh, you can just run <laughs> you, around you, with it, right? You, yeah, okay. you, wherever you go, you can you can just put it up. And it was called like a swoop peak. That, that's what it was called because like you put it down and then like again you see this guy like it's like it wasn't like crazy, but you saw him like 
pretty significantly before you could see you. So I, I remember he, he used to do like like a whole bunch of lurk up ramp, unpop the smoke. And it's like, well, I'm just dead, <laughs> you know? So um, that was something that I think was being like used like a whole bunch of that tournament. And not to mention, it's just Viper was like very, very strong. I think something that uh, was really interesting about that team is they they play, I feel like, Palau 9, uh, the... Uh, what is it? The the Russian Cloud Nine. Oh, the CS Go team. Right. They it was like a lot of them. They were like all. I mean, if over people don't map. know, the coach of Cloud Nine CS Go was also coaching this actual team of Gambit. It was the guy Groove from Counter Strike. So I wonder if there's some like influence there. Yeah, it it, it was it was really like I, I'm mostly how Valorant has played. Like I guess like prior to that point is you know you group up as like a team and you just five man hit you know because. Uh, something in Valorant is executes are very, very strong because you combo like five different pieces of utility and it's very hard to actually stop people from getting out of like a choke point. But they took like a different approach where they would just kind of like one, 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 one everything. Okay. Where it's just, where it's like they would make a pressure on some area, then another guy would walk up. He would take a duel and it's like, oh, they're actually, oh, they can go back here then. And then so is it hard to read them, rotate. like to know where they're going to be? And yeah, stuff? exactly. Right. Exactly. So they, they, it just seemed like they were kind of like all over the place and can't. You, what we learned is don't move against right. them. Don't react. Right. Just, just literally don't react. It just sit there because, yes. like, because they fake like so much, um, it's best to just sit there. Just sit there and wait and they'll eventually like walk in. And that was like, something that we kind of like learned against that style of team. And they also introduced um, uh, some really cool like executes that we've like never seen before, where it's like they, they would combo like alts and do like really unique like trap plays that like I, I haven't seen before. So, I mean, looking even back on that match, uh, I really feel like we should have closed out bind. Uh, it, it ended up going like overtime, but I, I remember like I threw away a pretty key round and we had a few other like, uh, runs over thrown and then haven i don't even know i had a really good game on haven but like we so, somehow they, they picked like a that was their perma ban actually fun fact and um it, it was their perma ban and um they picked like a troll agent i think it was like reina or something and reina is almost never used in professional play it's just usually in ranked games <laughs> and I think this guy was like an IGL and he's just running at us and just sitting us down. And I'm just like, what? <laughs> like, what is happening? Because, uh, like, normally they, again, they just never play that map. And I think what was super weird is um, the, the weird thing was is because they never played that map, they played in such like a weird way. And um, it, it just like threw us off guard, like, in a lot of ways. It's just like, I, we never had to deal with like rain, like rain eyes or like brim smokes or brim all on this map because like no one plays it like that. Everyone plays like omen like all these different ways. So it really caught us off guard. So um, yeah, still I, I think we sh we should close that haven too. But at that point it was like two zero and it kind of just felt like I think the team kind of just felt like kind of like defeated at that point. It's like man, we we had like two really close like opportunities and uh, we're going on to like a really strong like map for them now. So it was just. It was just, yeah, I, I think people were kind of like mentally defeated there. Uh, as, for, much like, as, final map. as much as people want to do that whole fucking cliche, like a mantra, like maybe in it's a team, he loses as a team. Like in this tournament, dude, you had like some of those bonkers stats like anyone's ever posted. Yeah. Like, I think this is the one I remember where someone did like one of those graphs of like the ACS and you're just like the one dot in the like top right hand corner of the whole fucking graph. Like you, this yeah. is meant, like in the group stage you carried and the players you carried, like, like, how do you how do you handle that aspect? Because that's another thing that's hard about being a carry and being a star. It's like, you don't want to be a dick and then turn to people like, well, what did you do? Like, I was carrying... But at the same time, like, if you have a great game, it's, it doesn't... If people don't know if you're a fan, it's it's not satisfying to have insane stats but lose. Like, actually, that, that, that still sucks <laughs> yeah. too. There isn't really a consolation there. Yeah. Like, it's hard to process. Yeah. Um, hmm. I... I I try to approach it from the aspect of I try not to look at the people around me as much, uh, and I only try to focus on the things that I could have done better, or I could have maybe like controlled, and whether that be maybe with like um, with like a different teammate, like maybe I could have uh, said something, you know, maybe to help them, like encourage them, pick them up, or maybe like 
maybe like a round or something like that, I could have like, you know, tried to help set him up for like success more. I, I try my my I guess like how I try to approach it is um who who's the person that did this? I think it was Kobe, actually. Uh, I tried to approach it from an angle like, like uh, Kobe and Shaq, where it's just like, I think Kobe was, uh, you know, having some in- insane streak of like 40 plus games. But like, eventually it's like, hey, you got to give up, give the ball. I think the coach told Kobe to give like the ball to like Shaq, you know, and like, don't let him get out of it. So I tried to pro- approach it from like that aspect of like, um, sometimes it's good to sacrifice like individual performance to help like the overall team do better and succeed and thus their success will also be you know your success but it i mean sometimes it is difficult when you play like a really really good game um <laughs> sometimes it's hard to just be like oh well you know like you're just like you know what's like what's going on over here you know like why why are we not like doing well like because like you you have it in the sense like you feel like you're doing like a, a, you know everything right and you you may be doing everything right but I, I also try to look, I guess, like towards some empathy because, like, sometimes people just have like, you know, rough series, yeah. You know? So it's, it, it's just a balance. So I, I, I don't know. It, it's ultimately it's kind of like a balance because, like, I feel like you can't be depending on a person. You sometimes can't be like too tough on them. Sure. Uh, otherwise, they just they just lose they just lose confidence, you know. And like, it just it spirals. Uh, it's it's very easy to spiral even like in competitive sport where it's just like you start having a few bad games you start losing like a lot of confidence you start getting hit with like now all the fans like want you cut and now everyone on the team is like yo dude what, like what's going on you know so i try to I, I always try to approach it with like some empathy but as well as the competitive sport so um i i try to just do it as well just anytime i give criticism without any added like emotion um not try to be I, I don't try to be like super like negative about it where it's just like oh you like fuck up like fucking up is fine you know as long as we just learn and get better from it yeah the the only time i think i ever get like mad or something like that is if it's like a repeated mistake where it's like we've talked about this we've talked about this we've talked about this and now it's like dude like what the fuck like why aren't we doing like the correct thing but yeah uh, I, I i've just tried to approach it i think from like that aspect does that make sense <laughs> Right, obviously this Envy and later Optic lineup on aggregate has some of the best placings ever. Like you just average making top threes basically. But the big tournament at the end of that year, Champions, was obviously the big bomber. It's the only one outlier. It's the one we're in the groups. Like, yep. look, it did turn out, as we found out later, Ascend was cracked out and was really good. Okay, that one's okay. Yep. But the way you lost to the team from Thailand, X10, is even like, if you know, if people know the way that like, tournaments go where you can play a team twice, this is exactly how you would lose as the favourite because you beat them the first yeah. time the second time you win the first map so you're thinking right one more map and that's it and then they come back and then they beat you narrowly on the third map it's like that's that's like exactly the nightmare way to lose to an underdog and be eliminated from the world championship right yeah um so something something about that tournament is um we uh victor actually uh mid tournament got covid which was like it's like oh that was like kind of like a nightmare situation and there was so much behind the scenes like at that tournament like where (laughs) i remember like there was one instance or something like that where like a bunch of people started catching like covid and like they had like some emergency like thing where they had like all like a lot of the players like we all walked in like berlin freezing weather over to like get tested like it was like a 30 minute walk and like freezing (laughs) freezing weather all the way down to berlin to get tested it was just Man, and then there's like several instances where when Victor did get COVID, like we couldn't like practice uh, like anymore. Like they kicked us out of the practice room. It's like, oh, you guys all could, a few more of you could have caught it also from uh, Victor. So we're, everyone's going to have to isolate until we can test and figure out. So we like lose practice days. It was, uh, that, that, that chance was like a rough experience. And then, um, we didn't even get to go like on stage. So what they had to do since Vic did have COVID is, we were in the hotel and they found they built up like this hotel, a uh, very small hotel room with like four PCs in. And then, uh, you know, down like the f- uh, floor is like uh, Vic and like his like own like isolated room, you know, like alone. And he can't like hang out with the team. He can't talk with the team uh, or hang out with us like uh, he normally could. So it was like really kind of like depressing scenery. But so with the whole like Thailand games, uh, we started off pretty strong and then we faced uh, Ascent. Honestly, 
I feel like we should have won a send. I mean, if you look at it, the score lines were so close, but like, uh, I, I remember seeing like Vic, uh, whiffs like some shots. Oh, there's, there's actually even like a funny story with that. So in the, in the quarantine room where uh, Victor was, one of the windows was, uh, it was essentially just broken open. So the whole room is just getting, it's like middle of winter and the room, the windows just open like next to him, just freezing him. And it was just like, hey, I, like, it's literally like, you know, 15 degrees in here. Can you like help me out? Like, can you like fix this window? And it's like, oh, sorry, we can't have anyone come in. You have COVID. <laughs> he has to play like a match with COVID and the freezing weather. I'm just like, I feel so bad for this guy. So he, he was missing so many like key shots and the, some of the maps we should have closed out. But the rematch on Thailand, oh, that, Against that uh, Thailand team, I think they were called what were they called? Exton at the time. Yes, they were called Exton at the time. Uh, Exton at the time, oh, man, that is to this day that's one of the most depressing matches like I've ever played. Because um, we, yeah, we beat them on the first map. We're feeling pretty good. We go to the second map. Ah, uh, it doesn't go so well. We're like, all right, it's fine. We'll 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 go to Haven and uh, we'll win. And that is some one of my most valuable lessons I think I've ever learned uh, was from that. Because I remember um, against that team, we started up like 9-3 or something like that. We had a really good half. And then we swap over to attack. And, I mean, we started off like pretty well. We we started hitting, I think uh, it was a C-bomb site, like a whole bunch. We hit C like three or four times. And I think won all the rounds over there at C. And what ended up happening was they took a tactical timeout. So all of us are thinking like, hey, they're going to change something up. You know, we've just slammed the site like three or four times in a row. They're going to play more people towards it, or they're going to change their setup over there. And so we we went back like towards A, and there were three there, like in a trap setup again, doing the exact same thing. And what I learned, <laughs> what, what I learned, what I learned from that was like uh, sometimes, uh, you know, with the APAC teams, like the coaches aren't thinking about like the tactics. When they take timeouts, it's like to get the mental up. It's a, it's a, it's to like hype the hype the boys up, not to actually adapt the strategies. And I, I just remember like after that one of those key rounds, and then like we had a really close round in which like I, I remember this. I think his name was Cruz. He was like a breach player, and we we started rushing onto like the A site, and he has breach alt. He has all this utility. And I just remember him instead of using it, he just swung us dry like one round and somehow killed three of us. It was just the most devastating thing I've ever seen in my life. He he like he perfectly like headshot three of us like on this one round and we just lost out. And it's just like, man, it was the most depress it was the most depressing loss I think I've ever had. And ah oh, man. The so, something I learned is like some of these APAC teams, their mechanics are very, very good. Like they are very fast sometimes. And they hit some ridiculous shots. So it, it yeah. It, that 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 loss is that is still haunting to this day. Right, obviously as much as that sucked, Riot Games the universe was about to give you the biggest gift of all time because then Chamber <laughs> came, right? And if people don't know, you are essentially synonymous with Chamber, like that was what you did all this yeah. amazing work in 2022 with and like as I described earlier like what a jet could do if it was like simple and here. In some ways, yeah. you know, Chamber's even more OP when it was the best agent, right? <laughs> Uh, I would say I, I'd always argue that probably Prime Jet is the absolute strongest, uh, just because like at her absolute peak, she had like three smokes. She had okay. like uh, like some something r- ridiculous. Uh, basically, yeah, three like eight second smokes that you could just keep one way <laughs> stuff like left and right. I mean, at and, least like, for your uh, style of play, then Chamber but, was OP, right? But 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 yeah, no, Ch- Chamber was a really good at least fit for like my style because like um mechanically speaking like i'm very very <laughs> you want to call it screaming me like uh they talk about my like my one taps or whatever but uh i was really good with um just like first ball accuracy and hitting like some uh headshots like my rifle and just even my um my uh just my first ball these were really good so the fact that i could have like a Basically, a um, deagle every single round was it, it was really nice, and not to mention um, chamber opened up a lot new, lot more possibilities where you could play. Like, there's some angles in which jet c- 
couldn't play that you could play with chamber like some you could play some very risky angles with like chamber that you couldn't with jet and that opened up like a whole bunch of possibilities where i felt like i could always punish that person because i'd always hit the shot um if they didn't use proper utility to clear that like even if they know i'm there like i would get I, i'd be able to get the kill unless they use the uh utility proper uh properly to clear me so um at least for my style of play, yeah, it was it was really good. And I remember um, people thinking that Chamber wasn't going to be very good. Like people did not like adopt Chamber very early on, even though I knew that agent would be very very strong. And people didn't really like see. I, I guess people didn't see what I saw uh, with them, where you could easily replace like uh, your former Sentinel player and just have like very similar levels of impact. Right, obviously, we're not going to skip ahead on this topic. I'm just going to f- seed it, though. Later on, ov- the obvious nerf they did probably went too far the other way. But the, the first thing I remember when I watched one of these games, when I'd been told by Geo, like, what the chamber agent was like, I remember watching a game and being like, is that a fucking joke that you can actually just teleport when they're in trouble and just go over on the other side of the map? Like, what? Like, mm. to me, there was the obvious thing they should have done... Obviously, you did. You wouldn't want them to. But if they wanted to make it fair, they would have just made it like still really good, but just do like something in between the mega fucking nerf they did. Like just make it like shorter distance, but still good. You know, like the problem is if you knew what you were doing with that, that just gave like a whole new dimension to the agent too, right? Yeah. So the the big thing that I think what they did was is they completely reworked the whole teleporter uh, to where it's just like if you don't teleport between two locations anymore, it's kind of like. You just have like a big like uh, circle that you can play in this, and then it'll you can tell for a very like short distance. They it it really killed it in a lot of ways because um, the angles you can play are so limited. There's a, there's almost like no angles you can play. But the real big nerf that actually really killed that agent was um, the trip nerf. So previously uh, with the trip on chamber, is you could place it anywhere and it'll always be activated. Um, right. But now they modified it so you have to play within like a certain range of that trip. And so now it's like you get so much less value because the whole point of Chamber really is to... It's mainly for your op player uh, because when you play Jet and like other agents, it's a weird dynamic where usually you want your Jet as the op. Uh, basically, you always op on Jet, especially like on defense. Like Ideally, you always want to try to have like an op in your hands for the most part. Um, because you jet paired with op is super strong because like you said, you can take very aggressive angles, instantly dash out, you know, and uh good space. It, it's the best agent for op and really no other agent can op. So um, outside chamber. So the, always the core problem was is at the same token, jet is also the duelist and the entry. So on like attack, you couldn't op really as jet because like, the whole your whole kit is designed to help your team try to get through these choke points, and really you're the only person that can get to, through those choke points. So um, that was obviously like the big issue is like uh, you you have like a jet opper on defense, but you can't really op on attack. So like chamber fixed both. You could op on uh, defense with chamber and on attack because like he's a sentinel, so he has like trips that are holding space, you know, for him. So what ended up happening though is uh, with that trip nerve uh, on defense now. Your, your spots are so limited where you can play, and now you can just listen for the trip, and you're like, oh, the opera's here. And now every team can avoid it or be ready for it at that point. So it, it just really limited the amount of angles you could have, and not to mention it's just... It, he, he's basically just kind of like dead now because it, it, it's so hard to get like consistent value with him. Although I will say they did buff him here pretty recently, and on some maps he's seeing a little bit of a return. Like on maps, you don't need like a really hard sentinel, but um, still, for the most part, though they they. they At its peak, what were, what were, how was the best way to use chamber when it was in this 2022 and it was OP? So my my style of chamber was always kind of revolved around. It wasn't even necessarily always trying to get a kill, but what I wanted to do was um, always try to force out as much utility as possible. So. <laughs> I I tried to the best of my ability is like if I could get away that with uh you know staying there for a few extra seconds to make them use like another piece of utility to clear me like I would um 
so what did I end up doing is like a lot of, a lot of chambers I felt like how they would do is like someone would flash them and they would instantly teleport. But for me, I would always like talk and I reposition just slightly so it's more of like an off angle. So they still have to walk into me. And I would always try to keep like forcing just more and more utility out and make them respect that. And I'd also try to hide my presence as much as possible. So where they never know like where the op is. So they're always forced to use uh they're always forced to have proper utility to clear me or risk dying. And that was kind of like my that's how I, I think it was best played, is just trying to get as much as humanly possible. And not to mention, um, just being able to have like also a sheriff you can whip out if you're ever in uh, danger was also kind of nice. So if you do if you do hit your op shot and the other people are coming, you could just <laughs> one tap them with the sheriff uh, potentially as well. But yeah, that was, that was kind of like my whole goal is always to just try to max as much as I could uh, with them essentially just always trying to play different spots keep them guessing and always force them to have like correct like you tell no matter what or risk dying i've been pleasantly surprised during the time i've had my patreon and my patreon community the Illuminati, by both the financial support they've provided and the moral support and so this video was kindly supported and made possible by starlust theo buenzelli ahmed haju matt pognaccio racula Tukan, jensen go animosity tobias bernasconi bot pounder 420 yurka 86 tosh and as always you know it a special thanks goes out to my main man jerky's minion would you like to ask a question in one of those amas where i tend to go pretty in depth sometimes they even spin out into their own videos do you want teasers to find out who the upcoming guests are for the myriad of interviews that i do across esports maybe you want to suggest a topic or a guest we have a channel on my discord where you can do that if you're at the right tier and of course you could potentially take part in one of those lengthy esports discussions with me about whatever is on your your mind in the scene. Well, if any of those perks sound tantalizing, put your money where your mouth is and join the Skrilluminati today via the Patreon link in the description box below.